Through my work as an expedition cameraman and landscape photographer, I cannot but help to have become aware of the effect that we as humans are having on our planet. Some iconic landscapes, the great sweep of ice and snow at the poles, the seemingly endless lush green canopy of the Amazonian rainforest, the romantic crags of the Scottish Highlands, seem like they will be with us always, to awe our children and our children's children, just as they do now. But they won't. They're changing. Very slowly, it seems to us, but very quickly in geological terms. Some have not always looked like this either, but are very much a product of the hand of man. On my expeditions, I've never set out to document these changes specifically, but it's almost through framing them out, as it were, that I've become aware of the changes being wrought around us. I want to take you through, if I may, a lens eye view of what I have observed, share with you what I've seen, and how I feel that affects our planet's environmental resilience. I want to start with a landscape that's relatively close to home, Bodmin Moor in Cornwall. Many people look at the moor with its thin veneer of soil over craggy granite outcrops as one of Britain's most wild and natural spaces. But it's not. It's very much the product of human intervention. If we could travel back six or 7,000 years ago, before the advent of farming, when our ancestors lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle, hunting and collecting seasonal food, we'd see that much of the moor, in the same way as Britain was back then, was once heavily wooded. Then, sometime after around 3,500 BC, as our ancestors turned from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, to more permanent settlements that required land for farming. They began to clear trees from upland areas such as the moor. Tests have shown that the polished flint axe of a Neolithic man could fell a fir tree 17 centimeters in diameter in just five minutes. So it gives you some idea of how quickly it could have happened. People began herding animals, and planting cereal crops. And bit by bit, areas such as the moor were cleared of their woodland. Once the woodland had been cleared, the gra grazing by livestock made short work of any saplings, making it impossible for trees to regenerate. Bodmin Moor, with its many monuments, stone circles and cairns, and the remains of cultivation strips, is very much a product of human intervention. Another landscape that tells a similar story are the highlands of Scotland. The ever-changing light, a constant inspiration for photographers. Again considered by many to be a natural landscape, but they were once heavily wooded too. Scottish nat National Heritage recently commissioned a report that concluded that climatic changes were not always the primary reason for a change in land use in the highlands, but that socio and economic factors were often much more important in the creation of the landscape that we see today. In Scotland, a mixture of a Caledonian forest, which is a mixture of Scots pine, birch, oak, rowan, and juniper, once covered great swathes of the highlands. Then around 4,500 years ago, a period of cold, wet weather began. This caused the retreat of the forests and encouraged the formation of peat bogs. Then farmers cutting timber for fuel and building materials or grazing livestock promoted further deforestation. By the time the Romans arrived, over half of the native forest had disappeared. By the 18th century, any value in the remaining forests was greatly undermined by cheap imports from the Scandinavian and Baltic states, giving little economic incentive to preserve what was left of the Caledonian forest. By the 19th century, the Victorians had already fallen in love with the wild, treeless landscape now forever associated with the highlands. 
A few remnants of Caledonian forests do remain around the central highlands that have escaped the effects of climate change, the axe, and the sharp teeth of sheep and cattle. One of my favorite landscapes in the world to photograph is treeless Iceland, a raw, dramatic landscape forged by the forces of nature. The constantly changing weather give endless variations in the play of light that make it something of a photographer's dream. I have some images here. This is an image here of a typical Icelandic landscape, as this is. As you can see again, it's largely devoid of trees. This was not always the case. When the Norse arrived in the ninth century to an island all but uninhabited, save for a few Irish monks strung out along the southern shores, 25% of Iceland was covered in birch forest and woodland. However, the Norse's skills as seamen, the skill of seamen, that would see them come to dominate much of northwestern Europe only a few centuries la later, meant they were heavily reliant on timber to build their ships. So they took their axes to what, what trees they found, and Iceland's forests were quickly decimated as well. As we all know, the removal of trees whose roots help to stabilize the soil can quickly lead to soil degradation. It's estimated that 90% of the forest and 40% of the soil that existed in 9th century Iceland has now disappeared. And that 73% of the modern land surface is now subject to erosion. As a result, much of the interior of Antarctica is just a black desert of basaltic sand. Iceland soil is particularly vulnerable to wind erosion because it's made up of a high proportion of light volcanic ash, like this. Tests were done, in fact, on soil samples taken from around the world experiencing severe, from places experiencing severe erosion. And it was found that only soil samples from the moon blew more easily than those of Iceland. As Iceland's soil further and further degraded, countless volcanic eruptions spewed volcanic ash that fell on bare ground. Rather than collecting in sheltered woodlands where it could combine with organic material and create a rich, fertile soil, it was swept across the interior of Iceland, creating desertification on a massive scale. In 2014, I went on my first Antarctic expedition. Again, the, the climatic conditions in Antarctica can make for some brilliant photographic opportunities. This is a 22-degree halo, or a sun dog, which is formed by ice crystals being blown up by the Antarctic winds and hanging in the air, creating this halo effect around the sun. Part of the expedition I was on was to collect scientific data. So as we crossed the interior of Antarctica, we stopped at set intervals to take ice core samples that could be later analyzed to give a better understanding of how climate change is affecting the interior of Antarctica. Traveling across Antarctica, you can't help but be struck by the enormity of the landscape. Ice stretches as far as you can see in every direction, beyond the horizon, and even driving, you travel for day after day and the landscape changes very little. It seems impossible that we could be having a f an effect on this huge, giant sheet of ice. Yet, scientists are seeing a reduction in ice even in the interior of Antarctica now. One of the fundamental goals of the expedition was to raise awareness of some of the issues being faced by Antarctica, particularly the prospect of mining. The 25-year anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty was approaching that bans military activity and mining in Antarctica. And there were fears 
that some of the signatory nations might be keener to exploit the resources that so many people believe are under Antarctica's ice sheet than they were to protect the fragile landscape. Fortunately, in 2016, all of the 29 nations reaffirmed the commitment to this ban on mining. I want to take you now to Chile. I was recently enough, lucky enough to visit Patagonia, another landscape threatened with environmental change. While there, I was invited to stay with the family of Don Aquilino, who farms a remote region of Patagonia, still living the life of a traditional gaucho. There he is. Don, Don Aquilino is an incredible man. He, along with his late father, he led the fight against the Hydroeastern hydroelectric project in Chilean Patagonia. Planners of this project believe that it could pr produce a significant proportion of Chile's energy needs. Through the damming of the Pascal and Baker rivers in five locations to create giant hydroelectric plants. It would have been Chile's largest energy project. And all this energy would have been created as renewable and fossil free. However, it would have flooded 15,000 acres of Patagonian wilderness. Power lines would have needed to be built to, to take the power to Santiago, roads built to service the whole project. And overall, the total effect would have been the deforestation of 23,000 hectares of Patagonia, affecting many of its national parks and reserves. Fierce debate raged for four years with protests in the street decrying the loss of habitat. And finally, in 2014, the project was shelved. Don Aquilino took me up to see the Neff Glacier, an incredibly beautiful area, a unique wilderness, and just some of the pristine habitat that would have been lost to this project. For many, and I think I'm inclined to agree, the loss of such a unique landscape was too big a cost to bear. However, Chile's energy, energy needs continue to grow, and now its reliance on non-renewable sources of energy is that much bigger than if the project had gone ahead. There are also signs of hope that I've witnessed on my travels in many of these places. In Scotland, they're looking at rewilding which is the reintroduction of native species that have been lost that could be the solution to bringing back some of the native woodland and habitat that has been lost to intensive grazing. In Iceland, there's widespread efforts to plant trees across the island to help stabilize the soil and hopefully reverse the desertification process. For Antarctica, all of those 29 signatory nations made a firm commitment to retain and to continue to implement the bi bi ban on mining with the highest priority. In Chile, the current president, Sebastián Piñera, unveiled ambitious plans in the run-up to the 20 2017 elections to use wind and solar power to make Chile's energy grid 100% renewable by 2040. Humanity's changed many of what we consider to be our most permanent landscapes, and not always for the better. While these landscapes continue to face ch challenges, there are signs of hope. It's my hope that by allowing more people to share in these beautiful, remote, and sometimes inaccessible places, I can bring attention to the challenges being faced by these landscapes and hopefully persuade people of the necessity in caring for them for future generations. Thank you.